All right, good Sunday morning, everyone, and welcome to The Real Story. I'm Matt Karen. It is one of the most social life experiences that you will ever have, college. And this year, students are doing it in a socially distanced world. Let's talk about how institutions of higher learning are handling this COVID challenge. And joining me now is the president of the University of Connecticut, President Tom Katsalaeus. President Katsalaeus, uh, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure, Matt. Thank you for having me. Good morning. So uh, 33 positive uh, cases of students uh, with COVID at UConn as of this taping, 133 cumulative cases, uh, including four new cases on campus and 17 off campus. Uh, talk about how, how UConn's handling this challenge. Oh, with a, a, with a lot of vigilance, a big dose of humility and a lot of determination. Uh, we've... Um, put in place some some measures to to uh, do aggressive testing uh, behavior modification and also um, contact tracing and quarantine and and uh, uh, so far we're very pleased that we're in our third week of we just finished our third week of instruction and our fifth week of residency and the numbers are as low as as you mentioned in fact um, you know 33 on campus out of a total of 5,000 students is about a 0.6 percent positivity rate which is lower than the average for Connecticut as a whole. Uh, so uh, we're, we're pleased with that. Uh, we, we did have a cluster form on campus uh, that, um, that grew and, and we were able to bring that back down to this number and we're seeing a cluster now off campus and we're applying the same so approach So talk about uh, that there. if you could. Yeah. Talk, talk, talk about that if you could. The first signs of COVID on campus seem to be related to an outbreak uh, traced back to the football team, which ultimately resulted in the quarantine of the Garrigus Residence Hall. That's where many of the athletes live. And there was also a more recent flare up at the Oaks on the Square apartments off campus. Uh, you've issued 14 day quarantine guidance there. Um, is there any evidence that those clusters of infection have slowed? Well, I, our expectation is based on the contact tracing and, and who's been exposed that they'll grow for a little while. So we expect this to follow the same trend that took place in Garrigus, where it will go, grow for a while because the exposures have already taken place. And then the quarantine will have its effect and uh, we hope it will come down in the, in the same way. Uh, in the case of the Oaks, uh, that's off-campus housing, and obviously if those students can't go anywhere, they still need the basics. Uh, tell me about how the Mansfield community and the Yukon community has really stepped up here to donate not only money but food and other supplies that these kids are going to need. Oh, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. I mean, it, it's really, really touching and heartwarming to see the, the Mansfield community rally. I mean, we, they've been great partners all along. We've been working closely with Mayor Tony Moran. Uh, we've been very supportive about trying to establish new uh, restrictions on large gatherings together. And, uh, you know, it, it, we really view uh, our responsibility as protecting uh, our students, our faculty, our staff, but the entire community and the, and the responsibility for public health in the state of Connecticut. And it's been a real partnership with them. And, and when we saw through contact tracing that, that indications there was going to be spread throughout this building in, in Store Center, uh, our medical staff said that indicated this, this was time to do a similar sort of quarantine to what we did on campus in Garrigus to protect the students yep. and, and other residents living in that building, but also to protect the town. And so we took that step in partnership with the a regional department of public health. And uh, we quarantined those students for two weeks. It was very difficult. And it was, it was overwhelming to us that uh, you know, uh, over the weekend, last weekend, uh, the Mansfield community came together and volunteers put together 600 care packages for our students. You can't imagine how much that means to the students. They're bewildered. Uh, they're a little bit frightened. Uh, they're isolated, obviously. They're quarantined. And to know that there's a community surrounding them that cares about them and is supportive of them is, is just an incredible morale lift. So we're so appreciative sure. of, yep. of, of them and, and so appreciative of the Mansfield community. President Katzleis, when it comes to uh, COVID, we see the impact that large gatherings, parties specifically can have. How are you guys cracking down on parties and getting the messaging across on campus? 
Well, you know, we've been very fortunate. We have not um, been brought down by the large parties and gatherings that other universities have experienced across the state. And I would say it's less about the administration cracking down than it has been the students uh, rallying uh, uh, towards each other, right? So the students, uh, they want to stay healthy and they want us to stay open. And uh, they realize what a risk large gatherings are. So it's really the students telling other students. I, I think, you know, if if uh, you you invite a student on on the Yukon campus to a party right now, you're as likely to to get the response, "Don't you dare!" as the response, "What time is it?" You know. So um, it's really the students. Yeah. Uh, monitoring each other and and wanting to stay well, and so we we just haven't seen it. Uh, the uh, the revenue shortfalls uh, related to the pandemic at UConn and UConn Health uh, have forced you to ask the state for help to fill a more than one hundred million dollar uh, deficit. But Senate Republicans are saying the state has bailed you out enough. They say instead we should be selling UConn Health. Uh, what say you? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, UConn Health uh, was there when the state needed it. Um, UConn Health pivoted uh, all of its available bed capacity and its personnel to, to uh, prepare for the, ons the onslaught of the disease and uh, saved thousands of lives. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm really proud of UConn Health and, and um, I'm glad that it was there for uh, for our state and for our citizens, and it continues to provide valuable uh, services to the state. And uh, it, it, you know, th there are a lot of one-time losses associated with COVID, and there are ongoing problems associated, ongoing budget challenges associated with the unfunded uh, legacy costs. Um, but it does provide tremendous value to the state. Uh, with regard to the, so you have, you've asked. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if I could just follow up. So you did ask the state for help, but you, yeah. what has UConn done, if you want to explain a little bit about what, what UConn has done um, to look in the mirror and save money internally? Yeah. So, uh, you know, w with regard to help from the state about uh, this, we're, we're looking for $70 million for UConn Health, about $50 million for the unfunded legacy, and $20 million for the shortfall that we've um, we will have remaining from COVID. On the campus side, um, education side, we had a shortfall between 73 and 115 million, uh, depending on whether or not we can keep the campus open um, through through the spring. Uh, and we've been um, taking pretty draconian measures to reduce that deficit, and we've reduced it by about 48 million uh, by doing things like um, furloughing our, our management uh, and senior management, um, putting in, implementing hiring and spending freezes, eliminating four sports, um, making very different, difficult. Are you considering um, layoffs? We, we are not renewing contracts. We, we are not doing layoffs. We are um, uh, making very difficult decisions about, I mean, keep in mind that many, many of our um, community are, are either in unions or have tenure. So layoffs is, is not, not necessarily one of the knobs we have. Uh, instead, we've been doing things like um, uh, making uh, hundreds of cuts, really, uh, that are short-term uh, losses to our mission, but that we uh, can live with in terms of long-term, not causing long-term harm. So th that would be things like okay. uh, curtailing scholarly library subscriptions, um, suspending uh, certain programs, uh, you know, in uh, elective courses not being offered across the board, uh, re reducing okay. extension yeah, wanna, offerings. If I could, yeah. I want to just switch topics. I don't mean to cut you off, President Katz, sure. but no. I just want to get to a couple other topics. Uh, the no Big problem. East just announced that the basketball teams are going to be wearing Black Lives Matter patches on their uniforms. Uh, ESPN is reporting that UConn may go beyond just those patches. What is UConn doing as far as messaging to address uh, racial inequities and injustices? Yeah, there's an increasing uh, convergence between uh, athletics and social justice issues, and uh, and the the Black Lives Matter patch, the BLM patch, is a, is a nice example of that. And this is something that our athletes, our coaches, and our 
our entire uh, uh, university administration feels strongly about, about issues of social justice and, and sending that message against anti-black racism uh, is a step that uh, has been unanimously taken by the presidents of the Big East. But there's also people who say that sports and politics shouldn't mix. I mean, they say uh, that, you know, they turn to sports to escape political controversy in many instances and that the platform shouldn't be used that way. What do you say to them? Well, you know, I think social justice penetrates every aspect of society. One can't simply uh, wall it off and say not, it, it, you know, social, social justice is important here, but not here. Uh, you know, and it's, 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 uh, it's all encompassing. Can you talk about some of the social justice efforts that are underway on campus? It's my understanding yeah. there were some suggestions made from students at the African American Cultural Center. And due to that, uh, you just started this week holding a virtual anti-black racism course. Maybe you could touch on that. Yeah. So very proud of the response of, uh, of our faculty on very short term to student interest in understanding the world around them and responding to this. This is a, a real teaching moment when students are interested in knowing what's going on in the world. What is the historical context? What does uh, scholarly research have to say about it? Um, you know, give, give us the perspective of scholars to understand what's going on in the world around us. Why, why is it happening? How is it happening? And, and those kinds of things. And the, the faculty whose research are in these fields have come together to put together this one credit course and, uh, and give students that perspective on um, what's going on in their world. We did this, something similar last spring with a, a course on COVID, you know, with the, the need the students had to understand what was going on around them and get understand the biological context, but also the the uh, social, political, and uh, yep. and, and uh, economic impacts of, of the disease. So this is something that is, is what a great broad context research university can do. It can bring to bear its Less scholarly than, uh, expertise. Mm -hmm. Less than a minute left, President Katsalaeus. Uh, just real quick, <laughs> you know, we've been hitting some heavy topics here. Let's talk about an exciting development very briefly. The ninth consecutive year that UConn has made the list of the top public institutions of higher learning. What are some of the bullet points that you think distinguish UConn? Well, I think uh, this is, this is fantastic. I, no, number one thing has been our um, student experience, as reflected in our. You know, we're one of the top five in the country among publics in terms of our graduation rate and time to degree at 4.2 years. Uh, so students get get very positive outcomes, and that's one of the metrics. And and one of the metrics that rose this year was uh, peer assessment, which is one of the most heavily weighted. It's not something that we chase this this uh, ranking, but uh, we pursue excellence in every form, and we expect that uh, over time, the ranking will chase us or will follow us. And it's gratifying to see that in this case, it did. Got it. Perfect. Thank you so much, President Tom Katzleis, University of Connecticut. Thanks for joining us on The Real Story. Appreciate it. Thank you, Matt. All right, uh, coming up next on The Real Story, after 31 years of distinguished service to the town of South Windsor, he is calling it a career. The police chief, Scott Custer, is going to sit down with me to reflect and to talk about the state of policing right now in America.